the displeasure of Jesus. When Jesus therefore saw her weeping, and the Jews also weeping which came with her, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled. John chapter 11, verse 33. Grimm, in his Lexicon to the New Testament, after giving us the equivalent of the word embrimalmai in pagan use, I am moved with anger, I roar or growl, I snort at, I am vehemently angry or indignant with someone, tells us that in Mark chapter 1, verse 43, and Matthew chapter 9, verse 30, it has a meaning different from that of the pagans, namely, I command with severe admonishment. That he has any authority for saying so, I do not imagine, and believe the statement a blunder. The translators and revisers, however, have in those passages used the word similarly, and in one place, the passage before us, where a true version is of yet more consequence, have taken another liberty and rendered the word groaned. The revisers, at the same time, place in the margin what I cannot but believe its true meaning, was moved with indignation. Let us look at all the passages in which the word is used of the Lord, and so, if we may, learn something concerning him. The only place in the gospel where it is used of any but the Lord is Mark chapter 14, verse 5. Here, both versions say of the disciples that they murmured at the waste of the ointment by one of the women who anointed the Lord. With regard to this rendering, I need only remark that surely murmured at can hardly be strong enough, especially seeing they had indignation among themselves at the action. It is indeed right and necessary to insist that many a word must differ in moral weight and color as used of or by persons of different character. The anger of a good man is a very different thing from the anger of a bad man. The displeasure of Jesus must be a very different thing from the displeasure of a tyrant. But they are both anger, both displeasure nevertheless. We have no right to change a root meaning and say in one case that a word means he was indignant, in another that it means he straightly or strictly charged, and in a third that it means he groaned. Surely not thus shall we arrive at the truth. If any statement is made, any word employed, that we feel unworthy of the Lord, let us refuse it. Let us say, I do not believe that, or there must be something there that I cannot see into. I must wait. It cannot be what it looks to me and be true of the Lord. But to accept the word is used of the Lord, and say it means something quite different from what it means when used by the same writer of someone else, appears to me untruthful. We shall take first the passage, Mark chapter 1, verse 43, in the authorized version, and he straightly charged him, in the revised, and he strictly charged him, with sternly in the margin. Literally, as it seems to me, it reads, and ought to be read, and being angry, or displeased, or vexed with him, he immediately dismissed him. There is even some dissatisfaction implied, I think, in the word I have translated dismissed. The word in John chapter 9, verse 34, they cast him out, is the same, only a little intensified. This adds something to the story and raises the question, why should Jesus have been angry? If we can find no reason for his anger, we must leave the thing as altogether obscure. But I do not know where to find another meaning for the word, except in the despair of a would-be interpreter. Jesus had cured the leper, not with his word only, which would have been enough for the mere cure, but was not enough without the touch of his hand, the Sinaitic version says, his hands, to satisfy the heart of Jesus, a touch defiling him in the notion of the Jews, but how cleansing to the sense of the leper. The man, however, seems to have been unworthy of this delicacy of divine tenderness. The Lord, who could read his heart, saw that he made him no true response, that there was not awakened in him the faith he desired to rouse. He had not drawn the soul of the man to his. The leper was jubilant in the removal of his pain and isolating uncleanness, in his deliverance from suffering and scorn. He was probably elated with the pride of having had a miracle wrought for him, in a word, he was so full of himself that he did not think truly of his deliverer. The Lord, I say, saw this, or something of this kind, and was not satisfied. He had wanted to give the man something so much better than a pure skin, and had only roused in him an unseemly delight in his own cleanness. Unseemly, for it was such that he paid no heed to the Lord, but immediately disobeyed his positive command. The moral position the man took was that which displeased the Lord, made him angry. 
He saw in him positive and rampant self-will and disobedience, an impertinent assurance and self-satisfaction. Filled not with pure delight or the childlike merriment that might well burst forth mingled with tears at such deliverance, filled not with gratitude but gratification, the keener that he had been so long an object of loathing to his people, filled with arrogance because of the favor shown to him of all men by the great prophet and swelling with boast of the same, he left the presence of the healer to thwart his will and, commanded to tell no man, at once began the frothy, volatile, talking soul to publish it much and to blaze abroad the matter insomuch that Jesus could no more openly enter into a city but was without in desert places. Let us next look at the account of the healing of the two blind men given in the ninth chapter of Matthew's Gospel. In both the versions, the same phrases are used in translation of the word in question as in the story of the leper in Mark's Gospel. Straightly, strictly, sternly charge them. I read the passage thus. And Jesus was displeased, or perhaps much displeased with them, saying, See that no man know it. But they went forth and spread abroad his fame in all that land. Surely here we have light on the cause of Jesus' displeasure with the blind men. It was the same with them as with the leper. They showed themselves bent on their own way and did not care for his. Doubtless they were, in part, all of them moved by the desire to spread abroad his fame. That may even have seemed to them the best acknowledgment they could render their deliverer. They never suspected that a great man might desire to avoid fame, laying no value upon it, knowing it for a foolish thing. They did not understand that a man desirous of helping his fellows might yet avoid a crowd as obstructive to his object. What is a prophet without honor? such virtually ask, nor understand the answer. A man the more likely to prove a prophet. These men would repay their healer with trumpeting, not obedience. By them he should have his right, but as they, not he, judged fit. In his modesty he objected, but they would take care he should not go without his reward. Through them he should reap the praises of men. Not tell, they exclaim. Indeed we will tell. They were too grateful not to rumor him, not grateful enough to obey him. We cannot surely be amazed at their self-sufficiency. How many are there not who seem capable of anything for the sake of the church or Christianity except the one thing its Lord cares about, that they should do what he tells them? He will deliver them from themselves into the liberty of the sons of God, make them his brothers. They leave him to vaunt their church. His commandments are not grievous. They invent commandments for him and lay them burdens grievous to be borne upon the necks of their brethren. God would have us sharers in his bliss, in the very truth of existence. They worship from afar, and will not draw nigh. It was not, I think, the obstruction to his work, not the personal inconvenience it would cause him that made the Lord angry, but that they would not be his friends, would not do what he told them, would not be the children of his father and help him to save their brethren. When Peter in his way next, much the same way as theirs, opposed the will of the father, saying, That be far from thee, Lord, he called him Satan and ordered him behind him. Does it affect any one to the lowering of his idea of the master that he should ever be angry? If so, I would ask him whether his whole conscious experience of anger be such that he knows but one kind of anger. There is a good anger and a bad anger. There is a wrath of God and there is a wrath of man that worketh not the righteousness of God. Anger may be as varied as the color of the rainbow. God's anger can be nothing but godlike therefore divinely beautiful, at one with his love, helpful, healing, restoring, yet is it verily and truly what we call anger. How different is the anger of one who loves from that of one who hates, yet is anger anger. There is the degraded human anger, and the grand, noble, eternal anger. Our anger is in general degrading because it is in general impure. It is to me an especially glad thought that the Lord came so near us as to be angry with us. The more we think of Jesus being angry with us, 
the more we feel that we must get nearer and nearer to him, get within the circle of his wrath, out of the sin that makes him angry, and near to him where sin cannot come. There is no quenching of his love in the anger of Jesus. The anger of Jesus is his recognition that we are to blame. If we were not to blame, Jesus could never be angry with us. We should not be of his kind, therefore not subject to his blame. To recognize that we are to blame is to say that we ought to be better, that we are able to do right if we will. We are able to turn our faces to the light and come out of the darkness. The Lord will see to our growth. It is a serious thought that the disobedience of the men he had set free from blindness and leprosy should be able to hamper him in his work for his father. But his best friends, his lovers, did the same. That he should be crucified was a horror to them. They would have made him a king and ruined his father's work. He preferred the cruelty of his enemies to the kindness of his friends. The former with evil intent wrought his father's will, the latter with good intent would have frustrated it. His disciples troubled him with their unbelieving expostulations. Let us know that the poverty of our idea of Jesus, how much more our disobedience to him, towards his progress to victory, delays the coming of the kingdom of heaven. Many a man, valiant for Christ, but not understanding him, and laying on himself and his fellows burdens against nature, has therein done will-worship and would-be service for which Christ will give him little thanks, which indeed may now be moving his holy anger. Where we do that we ought not, and could have helped it, be moved to anger against us, O Christ. Do not treat us as if we were not worth being displeased with. Let not our faults pass as if they were of no weight. Be angry with us, holy brother, wherein we are to blame. Where we do not understand, have patience with us, and open our eyes and give us strength to obey, until at length we are the children of the Father even as thou. For though thou art Lord and Master and Saviour of them that are growing, thou art perfect Lord only of the true and the safe and the free, who live in thy light and are divinely glad. We may keep thee back from thy perfect Lordship, Make us able to be angry and not sin, to be angry nor seek revenge the smallest, to be angry and full of forgiveness. We will not be content till our very anger is love. The Lord did not call the leprosy to return and seize again upon the man who disobeyed him. He may have deserved it, but the Lord did not do it. He did not wrap the self-confident seeing men in the cloud of their old darkness because they wrapped themselves in the cloud of disobedience. He let them go. Of course they failed of their well-being by it, for to say a man might disobey and be none the worse would be to say that no may be yes, and light sometimes darkness. It would be to say that the will of God is not man's bliss. But the Lord did not directly punish them any more than he does tens of thousands of wrongs in the world. Many wrongs punish themselves against the bosses of armed law. Many wrongdoers cut themselves, like the priest of Baal, with the knives of their own injustice. And it is his will it should be so. But whether he punish directly or indirectly, he is always working to deliver. I think sometimes his anger is followed, yea, accompanied by an astounding gift fresh from his heart of grace. He knows what to do, for he is love. He is love when he gives, and love when he withholds, love when he heals, and love when he slays. Lord, if thus thou lookest upon men in thine anger, what must a full gaze be from thine eyes of love?' 